Next on Book TV, a panel on the future of science and technology. Authors Michael Shermer, Clive Wen, and Michael Denton discuss the cultural implications of evolution, creationism, and intelligent design. This talk from Freedom Fest in Las Vegas is 50 minutes. So let me begin by, uh, by introducing everyone here. On the end, we have uh, Dr. Michael Denton, who is a professor of uh, human genetics at the University of Information Technology in Islamabad. Next to him, we have Dr. Clive Wynn, who is a associate professor of psychology at uh, the great University of Florida, and also the author of uh, Do Animals Think? Do Animals Think? Can Animals Think? Do Animals, do, do animals Think. think. And uh, then we have Michael Shermer, who is the founder of Skeptic Magazine and uh, columnist for Scientific American and the author of several books, the most recent being uh, Why Darwin Matters, The Case Against Intelligent Design. So what I'd like to do to start is if, if uh, is have each of you step forward and maybe tell us a little bit about your most recent book and, and perhaps uh, the most provocative thesis that you have in that book. So why don't we start with you, uh, Michael Shermer. Okay. Thank you. Whoa, okay. There is a God. He's just shocked me. <laughs> so I am Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society and the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. As, as you know, we investigate claims of the paranormal, pseudoscience, fringe groups, and cults and claims of all kinds between science and pseudoscience and junk science and pathological science and bad science and non-science and plain old nonsense. And, uh, you know, that's the sort of our themes, any particular kind of controversy. Uh, is it true? Is it not? Does it have some effects? Does it not? Can you measure it? Can you test it? So my first book on why people believe weird things was basically how we go about doing that, what our baloney detection kit is, that is how we apply the tools of skepticism and reason and science to try to decide if something is real or not. And often case, for example, um, uh, one can be a skeptic of a claim or a skeptic of the skeptics of a claim. We did an investigation of the Holocaust deniers who consider themselves skeptics of the Holocaust and we ended up being skeptical of the skeptics which I guess makes us true believers or something like that. But the idea is that it's not a position you stake out. It's a, just a tool uh, of, of investigating things. You can be a skeptic of global warming or you can be a skeptic of the skeptics of global warming, that sort of thing. Sometimes we've found in our investigations, uh, like in uh, uh, the investigation of chiropractic and acupuncture, acupressure, the whole idea, the theory behind it is probably nonsensical, that there's a human energy field that flows and it gets stuck at different chakras. And if you can adjust the chakras, uh, it'll release the energy and improve health and, and that sort of thing. And now it's possible that being poked and prodded and massaged and adjusted does have beneficial effects for health and well-being for reasons other than uh, what the theory says about the energy fields and that kind of thing. So I'll give you an example. Like if I was to make an adjustment of my own neck, uh, and and if you could, if you listen quietly, you, you might be able to hear it. And so we can see how it works, even if it doesn't have anything to do with that energy field. Okay, here we go. See, listen, let's see if you can hear it. Oh, oh man. Okay, that's boy, that really does work. Uh, <laughs> anyway. So uh, I just thought I'd wake up the afternoon uh, audience there. Um, so, um, uh, but, but it's not just medical claims or paranormal claims. Uh, from there, I branched off into a uh, second book on how we believe about the role of religion and myths and storytelling and the power of belief. And, and that you know, naturally led people to ask, wow, you're dealing with you know, the afterlife and God and stuff like that. What is your position on the afterlife? And I usually say, well, you know, I'm for it. Um, but of course, what we're for and what's real may not always be the same, so that leads into uh, the study of the psychology of belief. And it turns out, for example, that most of us, most of the time, believe what we believe about economics and politics and religion uh, based on where we were born and what our parents believed and what our peer groups believe and what our mentors and teachers and authors that we've read uh, believe. We're heavily influenced by others because we're so social, and so you can't discount the the role of, of psychology and sociology in determining what it is that, that we believe. And, uh, and so, of course, that does apply, and this is where I'm going in uh, my latest book, Why Darwin Matters, applying the 
rules of science to the big questions about the origins of life and why things look designed and that sort of thing. But, but ultimately where I'm heading in the next book, my, the, what I'm calling the fourth volume of my trilogy, <laughs> as it were, is, uh, is a book called The Mind of the Market. We're supposed to say something about what, what our books are since book TV is uh, uh, beyond January of 08, the mind of the market is about um, sort of applying those same set of tools of science and skepticism uh, to the market and see how the market works, how the market has seems to have a mind of its own, uh, how, uh, how minds operate in, in markets. For example, the fact that we were um, spent 99% of our history as a species in these small hunter-gatherer groups of a couple dozen to a couple hundred individuals where they were largely egalitarian and there's almost no wealth at all. There's no little, very little trade, very little division of labor, nothing like the kind of world we live in today. No wonder people resent free markets, don't understand the invisible hand. What you can't see, it's invisible after all. You don't trust, what you don't trust you fear, and what you fear you loathe. This it goes a long ways to explaining, this evolutionary economics model goes a long ways to explaining why people are skeptical of free markets, why they don't trust entrepreneurs and businessmen, because often in either in small evolutionary groups or in even in human history, large disparities of wealth probably were ill-gotten. And so therefore we should be distrustful and skeptical. The whole notion of a modern economy generating more wealth for more people is counterintuitive and it requires education and and conferences like this and books and so on. It, you really have to sell it. It doesn't come naturally and intuitively. Uh, so in conclusion, that's sort of my shtick science applied to as many areas as we can just to see you know, where the chips fall, where the data falls, and what we can learn uh, along the way because we're all on this journey together to try to make some sort of sense out of this complex and chaotic world. Thanks. My name is Clive Wynn. I'm the author most recently of Do Animals Think? In Do Animals Think, I argue that the way that animals relate to the world is radically different from the way that we relate to the world. And I think the people who believe that chimpanzees are thinking just like we do are sorely mistaken. There's very obvious evidence for that. If you invite a chimpanzee into this room, you will find the chimpanzee doesn't understand anything that's going on. Even one of the chimpanzees who spent over 20 years in training to, uh, to understand human language simply cannot make sense of grammar, the glue that makes our language so infinitely powerful. You can invite a chimpanzee to beg for food. Chimpanzees love begging for food. They beg from each other and they will beg from their caretakers. And you can offer a chimpanzee a choice. Would you prefer to beg for food from somebody who's looking at you or from somebody who has a bucket over their head? Chimpanzees do not distinguish between somebody who's looking at them and somebody who has a bucket over her head. It just makes no difference to a chimpanzee. My point is not to suggest that chimpanzees are stupid, far from it. My point is that the way other species think is radically different from how we think. Other animal species do wonderful things. Honeybees can communicate to each other three dimensions of experience by dancing. Imagine being able to communicate by dancing. Wouldn't that be an amazing thing? Dolphins and bats can see their way through darkness by using sonar. And they were doing this for thousands of years before we figured out how to make our own artificial sonar systems. We only discovered that they were doing it after we invented it for ourselves and all of a sudden had equipment that could detect these sounds that are unavailable to the human ear, that are far too high pitched for the human ear to hear. So other species have wonderful ways of relating to the world. And if I'm gonna try and predict the future of science in this area of understanding animal minds, it's going to be that we're going to be continuously surprised that something that comes naturally to us just doesn't figure in the lives of other animals, but that things that are completely alien to us and that are difficult for us to imagine turn out to play important roles in the lives of other species. I can't predict exactly what these will be. It's in the nature of the thing. We're blind to ways of thinking, ways of relating to the world that we don't ourselves share. So it's a very difficult thing to do to uncover how other species work. I also think 
And I was reminded by this by one of Michael Shermer's uh, talks yesterday morning, where he showed a wonderful video of uh, half a dozen people playing catch with a ball. And while they're playing catch with a ball, somebody dressed in a gorilla suit walks through the midst of them. I'm remarkable. I knew what to expect. I saw the gorilla. The vast majority of people in the room did not see the gorilla because they had been invited by Michael to pay close attention to the catching of the balls and to count how often each ball was thrown and caught. That's called a form of attentional blindness. And I think it's one of the most exciting discoveries in psychology of the last 15 years that people talk about the elephant in the room, the concept or the notion that is behind the scenes but that nobody will enunciate. Well, we should talk about the gorilla in the room, the physically present things that people are blind to. And I think this is phenomenally difficult science to do. How can you uncover the kinds of blindness that the human mind has? Because you have a human mind too. You have no other tool with which to go searching for this blindness. So it's extremely difficult. But I am confident that that will be one of the developments of uh, science in the area of human minds in the future. So I think that the science of, of animal minds, what I've written about in Do Animals Think, we will uncover more ways that animal minds are different from human minds. The science of human minds, we will discover more ways uh, that human minds are closed off to certain kinds of information. And the future of technology, I'm going to make a very bold prediction here, I am confident that somebody will invent a new I something. That's my prediction. <laughs> My name is Mike Denton, and my latest book is a book called uh, Nature's Destiny, in which I take the fine-tuning argument of the physicists into the biological sciences and argue that nature is not just fine-tuned for planets, for complex chemistry, uh, for stars and galaxies, but actually fine-tuned for biological phenomena and may even be fine-tuned for organisms very close to ourselves. So it's an extension of the anthropic sort of position right into the biological sciences. The reason that, in fact, uh, I was led to the um, composing and thinking about this book was that for many, many years I've been skeptical about um, classic uh, Darwinian explanations for evolution. Um, in my academic career, I've watched, for example, um, the story of the origin of life and I haven't seen any real progress applying conventional Darwinian explanations to the origin of life. And I've also been extraordinarily interested ever since my PhD days long ago in King's College in London, where I was interested in developmental biology. I've been fascinated in the abstract patterns in nature, the shape of a maple leaf, the deep homologies which permeate the whole of nature, the fact, for instance, that every, all mammals have seven cervical vertebrae. Uh, what is imposing on nature the constraints which lead to these highly persistent patterns for millions and millions of years. Um, the fact that the patterns are so abstract, think of the maple leaf, think of how it contrasts with the oak leaf, and yet both, both, both trees standing side by side in the same temperate forests. Uh, the maple leaf has remained virtually unchanged for a hundred million years. The Samaras, the adaptive uh, device which uh, carries the maple seed away from the tree has varied quite a lot. So the adapt adaptations varied a lot, but the maple leaf with this strange geometric pattern goes through time unchanged. Um, so I've always been very skeptical that the functionalist theory of Darwin will really fully explain these patterns in nature. Um, but how to explain them? Um, uh, basically, the way to explain them is to go back to some form of the natural philosophy, which was founded by Goethe and popular in the continent of Europe before the Darwinian Revolution. Um, but then, how to go from, as it were, uh, nature to biology. And then when I was, through the years when I've been working as a geneticist over the last 20 years, it became, I was also interested in the growing evidence presented by physicists over and over again that the universe was fine-tuned for, uh, for stars, galaxies, and things like this. And so I thought, well, perhaps this fine-tuning could ultimately explain 
some of these um, things which Darwinism seems to leave un unexplained in biology. And so, in, in fact, basically, my position is that, in fact, there is um, design in the biological realm which is derived from the laws of nature. So I'm echoing here, I I'm echoing something which was very popular before Darwin. And I think that the, this design is imposed in biology by a fine-tuning of the laws of nature towards life as we see it. And still, of course, it doesn't leave the details uh, of how this is done to be worked out. But if you can show, as step number one, that the world is fine-tuned for life as we see it on Earth, and perhaps even beings like ourselves, this is a huge step towards looking for the additional fine-tuning that might impose on nature um, the, 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 those factors involved in the origin of life and the factors which generated these extraordinary patterns in the natural world. So I, I'm, I'm proposing, in a sense, a form of intelligent design, but the design is coming from the, the very fabric of nature itself. It's not a design imposed or brought into nature from outside by a series of miraculous events. The design I see behind evolution, which works with the selectionist principle of Darwin, is coming from the very nature of things themselves, from the deepest fabric, the deepest ground of being. So that's my book, Nature's Destiny. It's a, an attempt to move into the biological realm, the ideas of the physicists, um, that the world is fine-tuned for life. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Now, all three of you have written very different books, and yet you're, all three of you have written a great deal about evolution. And this morning, Michael, you said to the audience that the fact of evolution is incontestable. And yet, in the United States, the vast majority, over, over half of Americans, simply don't believe in evolution. So my question to the panel is, why is this the case, and is this likely to change in the future? Well, obviously it's a you know, culture-bound thing, because this is not the case in most other countries. Uh, so obviously there's politics and religion and things that influence, and that was my previous point, the power of belief. Is there also, I think, uh, as I mentioned, evolution is counterintuitive. Um, you know, since we evolved in an environment in which things move relatively slowly, you know, ants and antelopes, they sort of run around, we can kind of see them, and uh, so things like the speed of light or the slow movement of continents, uh, things like that, we, we, we were not adapted to detect those. So they're counterintuitive, that's why continental drift and and the idea of uh, the speed of light and all that is just uh, hard to grasp. Or on the scale of, say, small subatomic particles and atoms to galaxies and bubble universes and so on, again, we didn't evolve to have any experience with those kinds of things, so they're counterintuitive. And likewise with time. We live a scant few decades, and that's it. So that's our experience of time. So the idea of um, global climate change over 10,000 years what are you talking about? It was cold last week. It's global warming. I mean, that's how we intuitively think of just sort of short term. Uh, the idea of things changing over millions of years, you don't see that in your daily life. So there's nothing to hook into it in our brains to sort of grasp it intuitively. Whereas intelligent design as a concept is immediately graspable. Everybody gets it. Yes, we have lots of experience with intelligently designed things and we know it was an intelligent designer who made it or relatively intelligent anyway. <laughs> Yeah, I think I would agree entirely with what Michael says. I would just expand and say that to some extent the resurgence of creationism in the United States as opposed to most other developed <laughs> nations where of course there are creationists but not at the same not mm -hmm. at the not with the same voice is is a somewhat perhaps unfortunate side effect of an otherwise extremely positive aspect of life in the United States and that is that there is continuous free debate and uh, lack of respect for for given authority you know people are willing to take on scientists and and by and large that is broadly a force for good but it leads to odd little things like this from time to time I don't think we're at any risk of anything like Lysenkoism where in the Soviet Union in the 1930s, evolutionary biology was sidelined for a generation because of Stalin's uh, crazy support for a, for a completely bogus uh, biological scientist. I don't, I don't think things could come to that here. Yeah, I think there's one in interesting point as well, and that is that um, one, one reason which might give um, creationists some uh, 
reason to sort of, you know, interpret the biological world in terms of creationism is it might turn out that, for instance, the origin of life and the origin, for instance, of the, the, the five fingers and the hand um, was a result of relatively saltational events. For instance, in the case of the development of the hand, there are three uh, phases of what they call Hox genes expression. And the, thir the third phase generates the, the digits. And it's quite clear that the digits haven't evolved from the fins of a fish. They are a new, quite a, a new innovation in evolution and a new gene expression system. Same really applies to the feather. And so we, it, it may well be, it may turn out that if, if there are, as I think, self-organizing aspects to the evolutionary process, these could be quite quick. And so it might turn out that when we eventually can explain the whole of evolution, we find that in fact it's much more saltational than has been conventional among biologists. Um, and um, this, I think, the fact that you can't, in many cases, in, in the case of the fin to digit transition, you see, you can't actually and probably will never actually be able to give a pure Darwinian gradually bit by bit, entirely bit by bit, explanation for the, these innovations. Um, I think this is, is one of the facts about nature, which is um, giving creationism a sort of a, you know, it's, it, 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 it's, you can use the, the saltational aspect to support it to some extent, uh, you know. I mean, I think that it, all these, if there are saltations, I think they'll all be fully explained in terms of natural law, self-organizational processes and things like this. Right. Let me ask you about, Michael, your, your biography for this event says that your book, Evolution, A Theory and Crisis, is a foundational text of the intelligent design movement. The intelligent design movement being, of course, the idea that evolution can't be explained in, in purely naturalistic terms, but that there needs to be an intelligent designer, that, that nature is, is in some way is irre irreducibly complex. Yeah. And, I, and I've noticed that uh, the Discovery Institute and other creationist or intelligent design advocates quote your, your work at length. Are you, are, are you aware of this? Are you comfortable with it? Have you asked them to stop? I mean, what, what, what is your thought on this? Um, I haven't asked anybody to stop. Um, and I'm not that comfortable with it, partly because, in fact, it, the, book should have, the book should have been called Darwinism, A Theory in Crisis, because I do think that Darwinism is now in a long-term crisis. I don't think you can explain the whole biological world in terms of tiny, adaptive, classic Darwinian mechanisms, right? So that's, that's one thing. I should have probably have called the book that. Right. And the first chapter was Genesis Rejected. So, I mean, I tried to make it obvious that I was coming to this subject rejecting the traditional biblical view of how things came about. Um, on the other hand, as well, my views have changed since the mid-80s. Uh, my views have changed. Uh, and uh, some of the things, in fact, uh, I, some of the arguments I proposed in that were probably slightly forceful and vigorous um, about discontinuity in nature. Um, but I still do believe that, we're, as I say, when we do work out, I, I hadn't discovered self-organization then, because that was, uh, uh, evolution theory in Christ was written before this, these ideas started to come out. I mean, I knew the cell membrane was self-organizing, but I hadn't realized the significance of this. Right. Saltational self-organization. Right. Um, and um, obviously, a lot of this has come from Stuart Kaufman, uh, who I think uh, uh, is quite brilliant, actually. Um, but that book was before the self-organizational thing started to come into biology. Um, and it was a very vigorous, perhaps too vigorous in places, argument right. for discontinuity. And so it was picked up and became that sort of, you know, and it might well be an important book in intelligent design. But when I wrote the book, I was looking for, as I think I found in Nature's Destiny, a route to explain the anomalies in evolution where there are perhaps discontinuities. And, right. and, and, and is, is that idea growing in the, in the scientific community? Or yeah, people I, 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 I think that in fact, um, I think it's gradually becoming accepted that the universe is a, 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 a very unique place in terms of the laws of nature. You know, wh whether it's a fluke, <laughs> right. whether there's a multiverse, whether it's an imminent intelligence in nature, you know, whatever the explanation is, I think right. people are accepting the empirical facts are this that the, um, the laws of nature, you know, you, you know, if you take a hammer and you shape a hammer, it's easy to still hammer a nail. <laughs> right. But if you look at the universe, it's like a precision clock. You can't tamper with the laws and still tell the time. Right. You've got to get the design just right. 
So that's the difference between a sort of Stone Age hammer and a precision clock. Well, what we found is that, in fact, instead of, instead of life depending on a, a rather, rather roughly hewn hammer, it depends on a precision engineering in right. nature, right? In a, in a nutshell. And I think that's generally accepted. Um, there's a huge range of, um, of, of, of explanations of why there is design. You know, what, what, where this is, you know, how this fine tuning has occurred. But I think that, that, that the universe is fine tuned. I mean, if there was only one universe that ever existed, I think you'd have to presume that it was there by, definitely by design. Right. There'd have to be an intelligence within nature or an intelligence without. It's or just we're just still ignorant of a lot of the early conditions of the universe and the science is relatively new and I think it's always okay to just say I don't know or we don't know yet uh, and here's six different theories or 20 different theories or whatever and start testing them uh, before we leap into saying it's this one or that one simply because we want it to be true. Always good to be humble in the face of ignorance sometimes I think and uh, recognize that we're still pretty new at the science game. It's only a couple centuries old uh, and so you know who knows how it will turn out. Yeah, and I'm not clear, Michael, that I understand. I mean, sure, the universe has to be the way it is for us to be here discussing it, but nothing logically follows from that except that we are here discussing it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's right, yes. Yeah. yeah, and where do you go from there? But still, well, still you could have, it could have been the case that a vast range of parameters would allow us to be here. Now we know that, in fact, it's one choice in, as Penrose says, 10 to the 123. Unless there's some underlying principle of yeah. physics, like a string theory, but maybe not string theory, but something like that, yeah. that might explain it. And it makes perfect sense once we know how the Big Bang began and therefore it gave rise to this equation that you can fit on a t-shirt that explains everything. And then those 27 different fine-tuned numbers all are explained by this one equation. And then that makes sense and there's no more mystery left. Yeah. I mean, it's also the elegance and beauty of the cosmos and the mathematical order of it as well. As judged yeah. by us, which as is by us, slightly yes. subjective. Sagan yeah. used to say we're carbon chauvinists. Yes. <laughs> because we're made of carbon, I mean, based on carbon, it's next to impossible to think of how life could be some other way. And yet, of course, it, it could. Yeah, but I've been hearing that argument for yeah. 30 years. <laughs> it's rather like artificial intelligence. It's always 10 years' time and it's <laughs> going to happen, you know. I, I'm pretty convinced that the, um, the carbon atom plus water gives you unique capacities to build complexity and I'm not sure that I think we know enough about chemistry now if, if there really was an alternative and it's the same as mechanical alternative lives I think you're going to have to use at least self-organization for self-replication because the complexity of generating highly complex structure the difficulty of constructing highly complex systems without self-organization in, a, in an, aut an automated system is incredibly difficult to imagine how that's done and so, how many self-organizing systems are you going to incorporate in your life system? I don't know. Let's see. I mean, I don't know, you know. But, but even if we were to accept that this form of life is the only form of life there could be, and that the laws of the universe have to be the way they are for this form of life to be possible, all that would flow from that is that things are what they are. Yes. It doesn't, it doesn't imply anything at all. If things have been different, we wouldn't be here discussing yes, it. That's but, all that would flow but, from but, that. But, but, but if there was a vast number of alternative lives possible, you couldn't possibly argue that carbon-based life or we were the, you know, were the only life possible, right? In other words, if you wanted to argue that the universe was constructed for us, right, you have to first of all show that there's only one possible life possible in the cosmos, right? Well, I don't, I don't know that you do. I mean, why do you have to show that? Well, why couldn't because, some god because have Because if, if there was ten, if there was ten different forms of life, right. if we knew about them now, you know, artificial life, uh, mechanical life, boron life, silicon yeah. life, yeah. if all these four forms of life w were well known and possible, you could never argue that life on Earth or carbon-based life was the sort of cosmic purpose or the world was biocentricity for that particular thing because there's so many other alternatives, right? You couldn't make that argument. So at least that's been, I think, established. Well, I, I mean, okay. I don't know that it has been established, but it doesn't seem to me to be, I mean, how, how do you establish that something is not possible? I don't know that you can prove that negative. And even as you say, even if we could prove that there were other plausible forms of life that uh, the universe does not permit, uh, I still don't see that that would have any broader implications. I don't think that would change my metaphysics. Also, the universe is well, no, not very well designed but, for life. But supposing, supposing, oh yes, there's, there's either. No, no, most yeah. of the universe is completely empty. There's nothing there. You can't live anywhere. 
it's mostly not designed for us. And yes. and for the universe is 13.7 billion years old, and, and we're you know just a few million years old as a hominid species. And so what was what was the purpose of this universe for the first you know 10 billion, billion years? years yes. Uh, well, it doesn't. Course. It doesn't really look like it's for us. Well, uh, the best, the be my best guess, the future of science. We're only a flash in the pan. We've only been around for 130,000 years, and if we make it another 130,000, that'll be very good going. <laughs> I mean, be a miracle. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, we we will just have been like Neanderthals who were around for a few tens of thousands of years. We'll have done a little bit better than that, but we're not likely to do marvelously well on any kind of a scale, and then back to nothing. Long sleep before and a long <laughs> sleep after, yeah. Well, I mean, how many spacecraft have we sent? A couple dozen out to the planets, and, you know, we're pretty ignorant of what... But there's also strange things as well. No, I think that, in fact, our existence is slightly stranger than this. In four centuries from the birth of science, we've, been, we've, we've penetrated into the atom, we've penetrated into the far distances of space. Our ability to handle mathematics and science is an incredible thing. The correspondence between mm -hmm. human mind mm -hmm. and reality is amazing. We can explode an atom. I mean, you think how amazing that is. Well, yeah, but if some, if some finer intelligence came down from another planet, we may suddenly realize how unbelievably stupid and ignorant we are. I don't know how, <laughs> how do, what is the scale what's by the, which we judge yeah, our own ingenuity? No, 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 no that, that, that's right, but I, I, I'm saying that, in fact, and I think it's a widespread feeling, the correspondence between the fact that we can understand nature in the way we do, I find very remarkable, actually. But, but remember the Copernican principle that we're not special. And it's, that's one of those counterintuitive ideas you have to repeat like every day when you get up. <laughs> remember, we're not special uh, because our <laughs> propensity is to think we're the center of everything. And we've always thought that. That's, that's certainly true. I'm, I'm only making the point, this is a work in process. Yeah, right? okay. I mean, we don't know where this is going, and it may well be we do find that you can make life from silicon, and there's all sorts of other forms of life. It may be that we find that, in fact, other forms of intelligence, other forms of cellular intelligence, could understand the cosmos like us. We don't know these things. They're speculative. But I am staggered at the success that humans have had in science, because there's nothing in our evolutionary history that teaches us about quantum mechanics, the mathematics that's used in quantum mechanics. It's counterintuitive to all the sort of simple logic of living in a tribal village. In fact, we have to be, we have to have the mathematical, we have to have the intellectual capacity for full counterintuitives to have science. By the way, Clive, in your final statement, isn't there a program called iLife? Oh, there is. Yeah, so there is. is. That's, there is. A, that's the origins of life right there. <laughs> it's here already. <laughs> All right, well, switching to a, a different topic. We've been, uh, we've been discussing global warming quite a bit at this conference. And uh, I know that you've written about it, uh, Michael, and, and you have some strong opinions on it, Michael Denton. But, and uh, the interesting thing is it seems as though the scientific evidence that the Earth is warming and that human beings are contributing to it is growing stronger and stronger mm -hmm. all the time. And yet there seems to be an ideological divide where mm -hmm. conservatives simply don't believe it and liberals take it as the gospel truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, I'm, I'm kind of an agnostic myself because I'm stuck in the middle. But one of the things that I've never quite understood that maybe you can clarify for me is throughout the history of the world, long before humanity showed up, the, the temperature fluctuated so much that the glaciers came down from the polar caps and covered the temperate zones. And then the, the climate warmed up so much naturally that they receded back to the poles again. And this went on back and forth long before anyone was driving cars and operating refrigerators and so forth. And so. So the question is, I guess I'll start with the skeptic here. Um, you mentioned that you, were, you had been skeptical about um, the potentially catastrophic effects of global warming, but you're, you're less so now. Yeah, I, I think if we break the problem down into four parts, and, and don't call it global warming, call it global climate change. That's what the, the professionals do, simply because it, it isn't always getting warmer. Some parts it's getting colder because of more carbon dioxide. So. Um, and the four, the four parts are, is the Earth getting warmer? Yes, everybody agrees on that. What is the cause of this warming, natural or, or, or human-caused or some combination? Probably a combination. What's the percentage? Who knows? Maybe 50, 50, 60, 40, 40, 60. You know, that's, there's much great debate there, and the error bars start to get a little wider. Uh, the third, uh, what are the long-term consequences, short-term versus long-term consequences of whatever the change is going to be? Here, the error bars get even wider, and our uncertainty grows. Um, and, and then the fourth part is, uh, what do we do about it? And uh, so in that case, I think it's, um, since this is a libertarian uh, conference, I, I, would, I would encourage us to at least take market steps toward 
uh, uh, solving the problem. Because for a whole host of reasons, including political and economic, we should not be dependent on fossil fuels and oil. There's a whole bunch of good reasons why we shouldn't do that anyway. So why not assume there's going to be some effect of carbon dioxide on the, on the climate? And so let's go ahead and start to clean it up. And let's get the market to do it before the government sets up some Manhattan-sized project, Manhattan Project-sized thing to do it. Uh, and that's, so that's my take. Yeah, I, I think we should, uh, we should all hope that global warming has been caused by human beings. Because as you say, there have been several cycles, ice ages, deserts of climate change that have had nothing to do with human activity and that we would be in no position to do anything to stop if they come again, as they most likely will. So let's hope that this global warming is human caused because in that case, human activity might be able to do something to stabilize the situation. Otherwise, the only thing I can suggest is investing in property in the highlands of Scotland, because it's <laughs> going to be beautiful there. <laughs> the hinterlands of Canada will be prime farmland. Yeah. <laughs> See, it's a good thing. We should drive those SUVs. <laughs> Help those Canadians. <laughs> yeah, I, think I, I well, tend to agree, well, with, I agree with the sentiments expressed by the other two speakers. I, I think, um, uh, back to the, um, what I talked about before, the convergence of evidence that tells us how we know evolution happened. What's happened in the last 15 years in climate research is that there has been this convergence of evidence from multiple lines of inquiry, lots of different ways to study how the uh, environment is changing, whether it's ecologists studying when flowers come to bloom, or uh, ornithologists studying when birds begin to, uh, in the spring, begin to breed and so forth, uh, all the way down to glaci glaciologists who do drill cores in the Antarctica and geologists and paleontologists and so on. And again, it's not like these guys all meet on the weekend to say, you know, those conservatives are going to try to cut back on, on our environmental protection, so we got to get our story straight here on the global warming thing. You know, they don't even know each other. They keep coming to the same conclusion. <laughs> and this is what leads me to have a reasonable amount of confidence that, you know, it's, it's real and probably at least significantly caused by human activity. Right. Now, th this would be an, an awfully expensive problem to fix if it, indeed it's real. So, so being three science guys who are reasonably well informed, would you say yay or nay, climate change is about to, will eventually cause catastrophic change in, in the earth? Or, or, or does the evidence not support that? What do you say, Michael? I, I think uh, from my reading of it I I is that uh, we have time to do something about it uh, gradually. We don't have to do a Manhattan Project size thing next year to solve the problem. Uh, typically, the doomsayers, doomsayers on the right and the left, are usually wrong. They exaggerate by orders of magnitude of when the doomsday is coming or it doesn't come at all. Um, so I, I think we have time. Okay. Yeah, I, I would be inclined to think that we, that we have time and that, that uh, human ingenuity, which I, I don't want to downplay, will, will be up to the task. Yeah, I, I, I agree with this as well. I, I think also that, in fact, if you look at the geological record, what sorts of changes have occurred, for instance, it's amazing that oxygen levels even have changed from about 15% to 28% in the geological history. Um, the levels of calcium and magnesium in the seas have changed quite dramatically. And it's, of course, this is why Lovelock proposed, the constancy is remarkable. That's why Lovelock proposed the sort of Gaia hypothesis, because it's extremely difficult. It, there's so many minerals in the rocks, there's so many feedback systems, there's so many cycles that working out how the, how the hydrosphere has maintained constancy, elemental constancy, and the ratios of take the sodium to, to calcium for a thousand million years, which has happened, is extraordinary. And it seems that the Earth seems to be able to bring itself back to these constant things. So if we, inc we increase carbon dioxide, and the amount of carbon dioxide we're releasing, do you know that 10% of the crustal rocks is dolomites and actual carbon set of sediments? Mm -hmm. It's 100 trillion tons of carbon in the rocks. The entire amount of carbon in the hydrosphere is an infinitesimal fraction of that. And the dolomites are very soluble. Look at cave caves compared with quartz. And work modeling all this is extremely difficult. But we do know one thing for certain. That the elemental constancy of the Earth's hydrosphere has been maintained by the Earth's natural, natural processes for a thousand million years. And there's been huge fluctuations in temperature, in oxygen levels, and other things. But it keeps coming back to this constant thing. Well, yeah, but that doesn't mean to say that human life could oh, survive sorry. under those conditions. Yes, but <laughs> life will probably survive. Life, but not human yeah, life. The range for true. human life is a very, very small portion of the range for life. Yes, but even, even when these massive changes were occurring in ice ages and things, it was always parts of the world which had, were relatively habitable, right? 
and, and, and in fact, in, in, in the ice ages, I mean, and, and as the climate changed in the Pleistocene, during the, the, the six interglacials, lines went to London and they went down again. So, you know, and man can move as well, you know, so, but I take your point. <laughs> <laughs> I think something should be, I think we should do something about it. But I also don't think that it's, it might never lead to a catastrophe because of the inbuilt, inbuilt controls on the planet, which mm -hmm. we don't know about. Um, but we should do something about it. Yeah. Okay. I, I wanted to give the audience a chance to ask questions here at the microphone, so why don't we go ahead and start. Uh, as this is a free market co uh, conference, I thought I'd offer that another reason for the resistance to evolution in this country is probably associated with the relatively high degree of religiosity here compared to other developed countries, which itself is probably fueled by the free market for religion in this country, which does not exist in Europe and other developed countries which have much more monolithic uh, doctrinal faiths. Yeah, but, but, but why, why, does, why, does, uh, why do American Christians feel threatened by evolution in a way that the Church of England never did. Darwin had this great anxiety that he was going to be excommunicated and blackballed from his club and goodness knows what. But in fact, Darwin is buried in Westminster Abbey. When he died, his friends telegraphed the Dean of Westminster Abbey, who was on vacation in Italy, and he telegraphed back, and in, his, um, in, in the Dean's autobiography, he, he wrote that he responded with alacrity that he wanted to see Darwin next to Newton. But mind, you, <coughs> mind you, Clive, you could say that the Church of England is the religion you have when you don't have a religion. That's right, that's right, I remember that. <laughs> I, yeah. I, actually, I actually wanted to move off of uh, uh, that topic. Um, the title for this session is The Future of Science and Technology. So I would like to introduce Ray Kurzweil to this discussion on the assumption that uh, most or all of the panelists are familiar with his work, his thesis of the, of the singularity, uh, coming through technology and a consilience of nanotech and biotech and computing power. He's so confident about this. As you know, Kurzweil is a very accomplished inventor and a smart thinker, a little wacko in some ways, I think. Um, and he believes he's going to live forever, or at least his brain will, thanks to the convergence of these technologies growing log logarithmically. What do you all think of uh, his Yeah, thesis? I always enjoy Kurzweil's work in the... Uh the projection in the future of, of uh, uh, trend lines, which is what he does, is always interesting and clever, but I'm always skeptical because in the past, people that have done that have typically been wrong. Um, and this whole idea of, as you mentioned, our artificial intelligence is 10 years away and always will be, um, <laughs> is possible. I mean, these are really hard problems. And uh, I'll tell you what, though, if, if he's right but off a little bit, I'm going to be really mad. If it turns out that we do achieve immortality, I missed it by like one year. <laughs> I think that, in fact, um, uh, basically, I think the, the best way, to, the most likely way to immortality, and this is quite frightening, might be through stem cells. Mm -hmm. I think this is quite scary. Mm -hmm. And uh, from the genetic knowledge of the various clocks that are changing longevity in mammals, for instance, chimps, on the best, the best situations, never live to more than about 35 to 40 years. Uh. I've met an older chimp than that. You have, have you? Uh, yeah. I've met a chimp in Florida who was in one of the early Tarzan movies, so was alive <laughs> oh, yeah. in the mid-1930s. Wow. But there are wow. a couple of chimps getting into their 60s wow. and 70s. Well, okay. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. Well, if that's the case. But anyway, to come back to the point <laughs> of clocks, we, we, are, we, 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 are, we are very close to working out what changes the longevity of different mammals in the genome. Because by comparisons with more and more genomes, we're going to find the genes that do it. I mean, we, we, li we live to 70 because, in fact, we're biologically programmed to live to 70. A mouse lives to three for other reasons, because well, it's programmed to live to three. This, I think, is a scary thing. And if you, if, you, if you look at the developments in genetics, and you marry this with stem cells, I think that we're into, the, into a situation when it's not, we won't find immortality by Kurzweil's methods. We're going to find immortality by fiddling with biology as, as it is. And I find this, frankly, if this is going to happen, this is going to be a real revolution in human existence. Interestingly, we, the, 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 but the sociology of groups that b go for that do tend to be libertarian and, and non-theistic generally, I find, because I've been following that movement for a long time. It's an interesting cohort of people that are extremely positive about science, very optimistic about the future, which is all great. But it's in, on, on another level, it's very little different from uh, mainstream religions who uh, harbor the day when the second coming is coming and we'll all be 
rescue, just like the, the left talks about, you know, in the future we're going to have this wonderful green environment or, 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 or a classless society or whatever. The tendency to portray the future in these um, sort of hedonic, uh, paradisiacal terms is very natural. Uh, the fact that you can back it up with charts and graphs makes it interesting from a science point of view, but it doesn't make it, I think, any, any truer than the other ones. Right. Next question. Okay. Uh, there are a lot of economic doomsday scenarios floating around, and uh, I was wondering what your thoughts were on whether technology in the next 50 or 100 years will increase productivity enough and make enough other types of advances that possibly uh, we could uh, solve a lot of those problems that are coming up, like too many old people and not enough people to take care of them, or uh, the monetary crisis and so forth. Do you think technology, uh, at the rate it's accelerating, will be able to forestall a lot of these problems? Yeah, most of them, hopefully. I'm praying about it. <laughs> I, I, think, I think people build the technology that they want to have for the to solve the problems that they see themselves faced with. So I think yeah. that's one of the areas that a lot of investment into technology will go towards, apart from the eye thingy. Yes. I'm here to speak for the skeptics because you're not. <laughs> um, contrary to what you said about there being a convergence of evidence on global climate change, um, I don't think that that's correct. I don't think that there is any type of consensus about whether the one degree Fahrenheit change in the last century is anthropogenic or within, you know, it's well within the range of natural variability. And there simply isn't a consensus. And then to, to argue that we should impose on ourselves um, the re regulatory regime that government wants to impose, but if we do it ourselves somehow it's better, um, seems, seems questionable to me. Yeah, she, she has an interesting point there, Michael, because, because you, you say you used to be more skeptical uh, about global warming and, and that you're more convinced, which means you've seen evidence that would seem to make you feel that, there's a, that there is a greater chance that we're going to see some kind of dramatic yeah, climate change. Yeah, I mean, I don't really have a dog in this fight, as it were. I don't, it doesn't matter to me. I haven't committed to anything. I'm not a climate scientist. I've just been sort of observing it from the sidelines. And uh, uh, it seems to me that if you, if you read the papers uh, and you, you talk to cl professional climate scientists, most of them would agree with my little four-point thing. Yes, you could find in the sort of fringe literature a uh, handful of skeptics. Richard Lindzen at MIT is about the only one you ever see from a real university who is paraded on TV. And the reason he's always on TV is because he's like the only one left. Um, and so while it's true you can always find a few skeptics to, to go counter. Uh, I, I'm looking at sort of the preponderance of evidence or where it's tending to lead, admitting that the error bars as we move away from the, the hard science to the political implications or whatever. Uh, but on your final point, I would, I would return to our, um, our, our guest here at the conference, John Mackey, CEO of Whole Foods, and uh, who, who presents this, uh, uh, why not take a moral stand as a capitalist and do things that are good for people, good for the poor, good for the environment. I mean, these are all good things to do, whether any of this stuff, regardless of what the data says. Who likes to breathe carbon dioxide? I live in LA. Who likes to breathe that air? Yeah, but th the point is that, number one, the air is cleaner now than it was 30, 40 years ago. Y and yeah, number two, right. that there, there isn't anything moral about foreclosing people's choices. And that's essentially what a good number of these, you know, so-called environmental, um, you know, dictates really are. And again, I'll challenge you to say that Lindzen is not the only um, person who's challenging the idea that it's anthropogenic. Well, there uh, are dozens and dozens of climate scientists who will disagree, who will say that, yes, we know that there's been a rise in temperature, but it's within the natural variability. We don't know whether it's anthropogenic. Maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but we don't know. And we don't know what the, co the long-term consequence will be. There are benefits as well. I would give a plug here for, since it's book, book TV, for uh, Tim Flannery's book, The Weather Makers. Uh, for my money, it was the best single summary of the data and, and the evidence that I've seen yet. That's a high, highly readable book as well. What, what, what book is that? Uh, it's called The Weather Makers by Tim Flannery. He's a Australian climate scientist. Okay. Okay, here's a short question. Uh, despite the fact that Reverend Malthus may have been proven wrong, 
but still a lot of people underfed in the world and dying from uh, lack of food. Do you think that technology will develop maybe a, a, a pill that people can take three times a day and <laughs> not have to grow food and, uh, and go through and wait for the whole cycle, you know? Well, the Jetsons like did it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Silent I'm, Green. <laughs> I, I, I didn't quite catch so it. Uh, 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 would we eventually have a pill <laughs> instead of eating some, something like that? Oh, okay. Yeah, technologically speaking. Uh, here I kind of like Julian Simon's uh, approach that uh, more people is not bad. It's good. This is human resources. And look what we've been able to do since the Green Revolution. And uh, just the last 50 years, the productivity of food is, uh, even though there's fewer and fewer people working in food production, we have more and more food. I think that's one of those nice trend lines that uh, trends positively in favor of market solutions to these kinds of problems. Yes, sir. Yes, uh, stasis seems to be the only uh, criteria for the alarm uh, posed about possible climate change. Uh, where's the debate about what's the best climate? Debate about what's the best climate? Uh, we have it in Los Angeles, so that's it. <laughs> oh, yeah. have you ever been? We have it, it in Perth. I was going to yeah. say. Uh, uh, Perth, Cl yes. Clive says he's always a little chilly anyway. Sorry. So Clive says he's always a little chilly anyway. He favors global <laughs> <a little> warming. <laughs> yeah. I think Perth, Western Australia has the best climate. I'd have to second Michael on that. It's, um, it's the only city with its own air conditioning, the sea breeze, it's marvelous. It's almost paradise. Yeah, yeah, yeah pretty much. Uh, I mean, uh, actually, it's an interesting question because uh, you, you sort of intuitively think, well, what's wrong with it being a little bit warmer? Canada would be, you know, you could do more farming there, something like that. Flannery uh, has a chapter on this in The Weather Makers that, uh, in fact, even a few degrees increase, yes, of course, it Canada is slightly warmer, but it also causes huge monsoons and, and uh, uh, hurricanes and whatnot in, in equatorial climates where most of the food production actually happens. So well, although it might be nicer in Canada, it will be much worse in the most productive food areas. That's, that's the counter argument to that. Okay, well the questions are over and we're out of time, so the, our timing is impeccable. Thanks so Thank much you. for being here. Thank you. This event was part of the Freedom Fest 2007. For more information, visit freedomfest.com.